Pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your peace. And thank you, Lord, for your word as we open it up now. Help us to see that there is a bond. There is an attachment that each one of us can have to you and to each other that brings about the peace, the peace that only sweet Jesus can bring. We pray in his name. Amen. That time period of A.D. 67, 62 to 67 is a time period that oftentimes is acquainted with or linked to the persecution of Nero. And for those of you who are not familiar with Caesar, the Caesar in that part of verse history, this is an individual who at first seemed to be making some good decisions as far as uh, his government was concerned. They all seemed like normal decisions. And then at a certain point, he decided that he wished the ruin of all things before his death. All things, including Rome itself. And as a result, he set a fire to Rome. He actually had some of his soldiers, councilmen, some other people just go about and start setting fires to Rome. And Rome, we find what began to be a blaze. And guess who he blamed later on once they started pointing the finger at him? He blamed the Christians. And so you can kind of imagine the situation. It's night. He has set the, the, this area on fire, including areas near Mons Vaticanus, this venue, the circus area. And what he begins to do is he begins to find enough illumination for entertainment. And he uses the Christians, literally taking some of them and, and putting wax upon them and lighting them on fire as candles. And so they begin to line the street there with these Christians as they begin to have their orgy of fun, at least in their minds it's fun, blaming the Christians for what had ensued there under his own hand. Now, I'm not sure what you would like to receive as far as words of encouragement during a time like that. But we have been looking in the book of Ephesians and we have found so far there would be some words of encouragement from Paul. Now, we're not saying that um, the whole time frame correlates with the writing of Ephesians. We find Paul is imprisoned. We know that. Uh, we do know it's for his faith. We do know eventually he does make his way to Rome where he is beheaded. But as you look at the book of Ephesians, which could have been in circulation during a time like that, you find that God is letting everybody know that I have a plan for your life. It's called the plan of salvation. I have a plan that's been in place since the beginning of time in my heavenly counsel between the Godhead. It involves each one of you. Each one of you is important because I've called you by name. So imagine you're one of the ones burning there and you know that God has called you by name for such a time as that. And then you look at chapter 2 and you know that God is a God of graciousness and kindness and you've accepted Him. You've allowed His grace to be employed in your life. It's worked wonderfully and you have borne such a powerful witness that somebody has turned you in for Christ, for your belief, and now you are burning at the stake. And so yet, you link each one of these chapters to what was going on eventually in the persecution of Nero. And I think it would, it would prepare the people's hearts with encouragement to face the fiery trials. And last week, a couple of weeks ago before Elder Pedersen speak, spoke, we discovered how God wants to use each one of us in the church. Each one of us reveals His mystery. Not just to the principalities and powers in this world, rulers and powers of evil, but also our heavenly family. They come and they help us get through the trials that we face in life. And now in chapter 4, we're going to go and the first part of it, is such a loaded chapter that we're going to take it into three sections. This first section of chapter 4 reveals that God in us, each one of us, brings a bond of peace that the world can never sever. And so, we're going to take a look at chapter 4 now. Paul, we find, is writing as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. In chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And so this prisoner of the Lord means I am a prisoner for the Lord's sake. It's for His cause. It's because of my message of Him, about Him, that I am in this place. Is that true? He's also a prisoner of the Lord. In a way, he is bound to the Lord. You find there's, there's that part as well. But he is here. He was persecuted, we find, in Jerusalem, other parts as well. Eventually, he finds himself in prison, appealing to Caesar. And he goes to prison. So he is a prisoner for the Lord's sake. Whatever happens to him, he realizes. Even his imprisonment is going to further the gospel. You look in the book of Philippians, you'll find he has a whole section in his book of Philippians where he 
talks about the gospel is going to go forward regardless of the circumstances. He knows that his imprisonment is for the glory of Christ. It's for Christ's sake. Not just there on his own accord. Not just there because he appealed to Caesar, which some question why he would have went ahead and done that. But he is there because he feels God has called him to be there in that place. And he says, here I am in this place. I'm encouraging you. I'm beseeching you. I'm begging you. It's like, you ever gone to wit's end with somebody, you, you, you wish that they would do something and, and, and you just, be a child or something like that and, and you implore them over and over again and you call them to your side and you say, you know, I just want you to know this. It's like, a, it's like bringing something to your side, summoning them to your side and saying, if I could just whisper in your ear, if I could just tell you something, this is what it would be. Paul's trying to use language to let his listeners know I'm right there, I just want you to come and listen Lend your ear. Come closely. Come close to my story. I've got something to tell you. And so he's just from the depths of his heart saying, I want you to live, to, to walk. In the Hebrew way of thinking, it was a way of life when you would walk in the statutes of the Lord. Walk worthy of the vocation where you have been called. Now we, we saw in chapter 1, we've been called since the foundation of the world. So since the foundation of the world, God has had a calling on our lives, a work for each one of us to do. And as we go on in chapter 4, we're going to find that He ascends to, the, the, to heaven and He sheds gifts to us and gifts us in different ways. There is a, a calling and a vocation for each one of us. But here in this chapter here, He's saying, live a life worthy of the calling of God. Not just the calling the summons, but the task that He has called each one of us specifically to do. Do you believe that God has called you for a specific task for this time in earth's history? Imagine if you were in that time in earth's history and you were one of the ones that would eventually find your way to a stake or to a chopping block for your head to come off. Would you sense that God had called you for such a time as that? For that task? You see, it's the task that we do now that prepare us for what we face in the future. I believe that God has called us each for a task now, a vocation, a calling. And so when I read this, I read it and I thought to myself, um, and as I was kind of jotting down in my journal, this is part of my journal entry, Murray, I called you by name. Not just to a knowledge of me, but to a vocation, something that you were beckoned to do since the beginning of the world. I had it all planned. I knew the time that you would be living. I knew the people that you would interact with. I knew all of this since the beginning of the world. And I summoned you specifically for a task that you are to do right now. Not only did we, because it was the Godhead, right, have a plan of salvation, but a crucial part of that plan involves you. And here Paul is just echoing the plan that we had for you at the beginning. If you want to personalize this text, this is the way I did it for myself. Murray, it's not just a call to the congregation, it's a call to you. Your gifts, your abilities, your shortcomings, yeah, your strengths and weaknesses, I have called you and all of that for such a time as this. Be encouraged. Draw near to listen to these words of this aging apostle. The one who faced death. They will encourage you to do something you were called to do in eternity past. Isn't that kind of what Paul's saying to each one of us? Put your name in there. I called you by name. Not to just know about God, about Jesus, but to actually experience that and to do what He has called you to do. His grace isn't just something we know. It comes in us, becomes resident. We find we are created for good works. There is a calling on each one of our lives. So Paul is is encouraging them that here he is as a prisoner of the Lord. Part of his calling, obviously, is to be in that place at that time. And he's saying, now your calling is to do what God would have you to do where you are at. And don't get all puffed up about your calling. Because in verse 2, he says, with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering. Where do you see those type of descriptions in Paul's writings? You find it in Philippians 2 where he describes Jesus who was right up there. He comes down to this world in the form of a man. He, with all lowliness, he descends to be one of us. Didn't he have the greatest ministry of all time? 
You look at all the prophets and everybody before him. They all were pointing forward to him. And here we are pointing back to what he's did and pointing forward to his soon return. It's all about him, all right? And yet he pursued that vocation, that calling with lowliness and meekness. Like in, Ma- in Matthew 11, he says, take up my yoke. And he describes and he links it with meekness. This humble heart doing the work of God. But long-suffering. With all long-suffering as well. You know, long-suffering is an interesting concept. It's oftentimes linked with patience. And you go look at throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament, I found a good summary in James 5. Be patient, therefore, brethren, to the coming of the Lord. Aren't we right there? Don't we need long-suffering and patience, gentleness, self-control, all these beautiful fruits? Behold, the husbandman walk, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. He hath long patience for it till he receives the early and the latter rain. We're waiting for not just the latter rain power, but we also need to be washed even now. We need the rain now as well. Be also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another. Brothers and sisters, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Take my brother and the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. You say, well, wait a minute. They didn't know the name of Jesus. Well, who were they pointing forward to? The Messiah himself. His name became, we find, is Jesus. The Lord himself. They are the ones who spoke in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. That long-suffering word there, suffering, affliction. When you see yourself as being long-suffering, do you oftentimes see yourself as being afflicted? Maybe even cruelly treated like the prophets? There is a prophet that we know of. Um, His name isn't really mentioned specifically in the book of Hebrews, but they took a saw and they sawed him in two. I mean, is that suffering affliction? I've never experienced that. I've had a piece of my body removed, but other than that, uh, that was painful enough. Imagine just totally having to, to trust God with every saw stroke. That's suffering affliction. We don't even have a clue what it's like in the 21st century. We think it's suffering affliction when the power goes out or when the water uh, all of a sudden is shut off for a leak, or when our electronic gizmo all of a sudden doesn't have enough power and we've got to plug it in. Okay. So we, we think of suffering affliction. And all you've got to do is go through an airport you'll see people thinking that they're suffering. And really what it is is just minor inconveniences. This was suffering affliction. An agrarian time period where every day it was hard work, where every day you didn't know exactly, especially with some of those harvest times, what would happen if a, if a load of ho- locusts came right in there and ate up all your crop. I mean, are we living in harsh times quite like that? Well, some people do. Some people, some farmers do go through that. But most of us, we don't know what suffering affliction is all about. The closest we have is some of our debilitating health problems, financial problems. We have a lot of mental suffering affliction. But back then they had that, plus they had these physical problems. And so these prophets, imagine them going through this because they spoke in the name of the Lord. And he says they, they had this patience. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. We have countless stories of Christians and people who gave their faithful witness. And humanly speaking, they should not have been happy in that situation. But for whatever reason, the joy of the Lord shone through them during that time. And so James is pointing that out. He agrees with Paul. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. What happens with Job? It's everything is restored. A message of restoration in the book of Job. And also the good news is, is that Satan literally had to go through God to get to Job. And the same thing happens for each one of us. We're not in this alone. God is with us. Have you considered my servant? And you fill your name in the blank. That's how God sees each one of us. So I want to be like the prophets. I, I, I just pray, Lord, that you give me the patience in the suffering affliction, when I go through the suffering affliction, this patience of Job. But more than that, I want the patience of Jesus. Because as I look at who all these prophets pointed forward to, even Job pointed forward to Jesus. Behold, my Redeemer lives. Right? He was looking for a Redeemer. He knew exactly who he was trusting in. And he looked forward to seeing him face to face. And so even Job pointed forward to Jesus so sometimes we need this dose, right, of long-suffering. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, you may not be in prison. You may not be going to the stake. You may not be having all those 
concerns, but for the sake of the gospel, you're going to need long-suffering to get along with each other and to take this to the world. You're going to need Jesus in you. And so the most beautiful example of long-suffering we find is Jesus on the cross. Can you imagine being weighed down with all the guilt, shame, and circumstances of life we can bottle up in this room, put it all in your mind in just three hours and see if you can process all of it. You all know what would happen, right? Mental breakdown, sweating drops of blood would be minimum, and you would need that angel to strengthen you. So humanly speaking, we find Jesus is long-suffering beginning long before even Gethsemane in his, his growing up days where he had to endure sh- p- shameful words from people. Who, who is your daddy anyway? And you just keep going on down through time. And you find this young person grows up in the Lord and he's still long-suffering all the way to the crushing weight of our sins. And if that weren't enough, we get to the cross itself. And you have people walking by, spitting upon him, throwing curses upon him, driving, and those nails are drawn, drawn right in every single breath of long-suffering. I could just have one of those breaths of long-suffering for what I'm going through right now. Wouldn't that be enough? He is the Prince of Peace. He is the author of patience. And so Paul says, you think you're suffering? Well, this is actually all pointing to Jesus. So back to Ephesians 4, with all loneliness and meekness, do your work, do your work for the Lord with long-suffering, forbearing, or holding up one another in love. In other words, be like Jesus. I mean, even Jesus on the cross, wasn't he still lifting people up? That's what the word forbear means. It's not just, it's not just uh, I'll come along and, and give a little scripture. That, that can be encouraging, but it's almost like someone is crouched down and you help them stand. Or you prop up, if you were a builder, you're propping up that wall. You're holding up that frame while you can eventually attach it to the hole. That's what he means here. Prop it up. Prop that person up. And on the cross, who does he prop up? you got the thief sitting right over the next to him. You'll be with me in paradise. Isn't that a wonderful promise to someone who never even thought he could even barely get by with his thievery? And yet here's a promise of unlocked treasures, of eternal value, of all of that, right next to him. That's forbearing one another with love. And so we must first receive him, allow him to change us. That means we have to behold him. We've got to accept that what he has done. And then what happens after we accept it is the Bible talks about how we're a new creation. We, we're just, eventually we're, we get to the point where we're just like Jesus. I can't explain how it all happens. It's by faith. Someone down the line will say to you, you, you know, you're such, you seem like such a kind person. Or, you really handled that well. Or, you seem so patient. And you'll be like, what? You, you know it's Jesus in you doing that. It's not you. Because that's the voice of Jesus in you. Think about uh, how how if somebody was cussing you out or yelling you out, how you would, humanly speaking, want to react. And yet, the peace that would envelop you. And you would react, but you wouldn't react in the way that you would humanly want to react. That would only be Jesus guiding that process. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's what draws us near to God. We see the depth of what God will go to in the plan of salvation so that we can go home with Him. He Himself will come and bleed for us. For He is our peace. He hath made both of us one. He hath broken down the middle wall of partition that was between us. He brings about true oneness. He is Jesus. And so Ephesians is saying, you got to be like Jesus. If I'm going to be like Jesus, i got to spend time beholding and looking to Him. Because by beholding, we become changed. And in the results of having that peace, it says you'll forbear with one another in love. You'll build each other up in love. When someone comes to me and says, I'm not saying you shouldn't come to me with your concerns, but what I'm saying is, if somebody comes to me just to complain about somebody else, 
Is that forbearing with that other person in love? That's why you oftentimes, if you call me or you, or you visit me in my office, I will say, have you talked to that person? Have you let them know how you feel? As a pastor, I will counsel you and I'll walk you through the steps of what you could do to do that. But I'm really encouraging you to build that other person up. Maybe, maybe they didn't see that. Maybe they didn't mean that. You know? Bear one another in love. Give the other person the benefit of the doubt. And it says here we have to be quick to do something. Look at verse 3. Endeavoring or hastening or being quick, like rushing over to. Being fast to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, there are a lot of words packed into that one verse. It does mean to be quick. And we're always fast on the draw to... There's even assassins in the church who want to take shots at people from a distance, you know? That's not what we're talking about. We're seeing, saying quick to keep unity of the Spirit. What does the Spirit testify of? He, Jesus said the Spirit will testify of Him. It will point you to the words of Jesus, the beliefs of Jesus. And so we have this unanimity of belief, this these beliefs that are linked to Jesus. Do we not have beliefs that are linked to Jesus? If, if we get down to the point where we, we disagree with somebody, let's all at least step back and say, you know what? That person's a brother or sister in Christ. We, we still believe. We believe the same. Let's keep that in mind as we now deal with this other problem. And so in ministry, Paul's saying, you all have callings. You're all special. But make sure that you're careful to lift each other up and keep peace amongst each other. And the word he uses for bond here, I thought maybe it was some kind of legal term or whatever, but it's, it's actually a, a, a term of like linked to ligament or like a band, something you tie together. What ties together all of us in peace? Who ties together all of us in peace? It says right there in the text, does it not? With all lowliness, that's Jesus. Meekness, that's Jesus. Long-suffering, that's everybody in the Old Testament that pointed to Jesus. We find they were described as that. And they were pointing to Jesus, who was long-suffering. Forbearing, lifting each other up. He was doing it on the cross in love. Who is the author of love? We find Jesus himself as the author of love, and he's the prince of peace. The question is, how does he rule in my life? It's by invitation. I had an African prayer partner. He talked about the steps in demon possession. There's several steps. The, the, one of the first couple steps is our cherished sins. Eventually lead to pathways. Eventually what we find is we, it leads to a pathway of fear uh, because we are disconnected from God and we don't have that bond of, of love and peace. And so what I'm looking at this text, I'm saying to myself, I need Jesus in my life. He's the author of peace. I need to invite him through everything I do and say. And that's a tall order. But everything I do and say, everything I behold, needs to be an invitation for Jesus to come into my life. What I watch, what I read, who I spend time with. You start going down a, a list, you're saying, well, is that do's and don'ts? No, it's not do's and don'ts. It's a matter of focus. I don't know of any other time in earth's history where we need to focus more on Christ than now. I don't even know of any other time where we have so many gizmos and gadgets to take our minds here, there, and yonder, which is good information sometimes, but we don't have that peace. It's like we're just, we have a steady diet of everything but the peace of Christ. So all I'm saying is, I want to invite the Prince of Peace to rule me. And then certain things will happen right in front of me and I'll feel calm about it. So we need that peace. We look and we combine this with the other elements we've talked about before. We have to accept the gospel plan of salvation to really have it take effect in our lives. We then want to share it. We're created for good works. We start sharing it. We're part of a group of believers who's sharing that. In chapter 3, we also saw the church through its sharing and its unity with each other leave Satan feeling very passive. The wisdom of God is revealed and he can't do anything about it. And now we're seeing that Jesus' love in the church brings peace. 
Think about any human relationship where there is no love. Where there is no love. Choosing love, where you choose the other person above you. Is there really any peace if you don't have love? And so Paul is saying, if we want to have true peace in the church, we've got to have Jesus, the love of God in the church. And so I'm going to take it and make it personal. I need Jesus, His love in me. And that brings peace to my heart. And then that brings peace to my home. And then that brings peace to my church. And then that can bring peace to my community. And then that can bring peace to all South County and all of Northern California. And the Prince of Peace can begin to rule. And then that will tie us all together and be preparing us for a soon return. So what is the bond? You find in the Old Testament what the peace does for us in our FBI sheets. Psalm 29. You can read the whole thing if you'd like to, but it's a praise to God. It's a, if you look at all these compliments to God. God, you're mighty. God, you're, you're full of strength. Glory is due your name. Worship God in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29, verse 2. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. We are being summoned by this psalm to consider the voice of the Lord in our lives. That's how we maintain the bond of unity and peace is by spending time with this voice. Because the psalm continues, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says, Glory! How could we not? How could you not, when His very presence and peace overtakes you, say, God, you're so good to me? The voice of the Lord, over and over again. And then it says in verse 10, the Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to His people. The Lord will bless His people with peace. I don't just want strength and power. I want love, joy, and peace as well. And so how do I access, how do I continue having this bond of peace? I spend time listening to this voice of peace. Do you realize the voice of sound of many waters? It can be a thunderous thing like when you go to the beach and you hear the, the rumble of the waves, but it also could be a peaceful feeling as well besides still waters. And so we continue listening to his life-giving words his voice. And what are the results? Go back to Ephesians 4, verse 5. We will have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Oneness. I know that concept keeps coming up here at our church. Sorry, I keep seeing it everywhere. But this is a bond. It's, it's like, can you really say that your hand is part of the rest of you if it's not connected? I mean, you've got so many things it attaches to. Paul is saying you're attached to each other through Jesus. And that brings about, the, this is called a bond of peace, an attachment of peace. You're all united together in peace. And that is a huge bond. In order to sever a part of your body, there takes a little bit of work to do. And I don't know about you, but I don't have the guts to do it. I mean, can you imagine... I've heard stories of people who got caught in a, in a trap out in the middle of the wilderness and they knew that they didn't get out of that trap, that they would have to die out there. And they, they, they began to take a, whatever they had, a little pocket knife, and begin just to chop away. I mean, that takes a desperate situation to do that. And yet, sometimes we're so, we don't want to be quick in the church to sever a bond of peace amongst us. It becomes a lot more painful than that. And so Paul says, this is a bond that if we would keep united together, that hell would not prevail against the church. That, that God would be one with us, we'd be one with each other. Peace would be the result because Jesus, the Prince of Peace, rules our church, rules our hearts. That's a powerful result of having the bond is that Jesus himself would be in us. And isn't that the Laodicean problem we find down in Revelation? 
Christ knocking at the church door and the door of our hearts has to come in. This is what has to take place. Let him come in. Let his grace be employed and he'll change our lives one by one. And so Jesus is the bond of peace. Jesus, the risen Lord. Jesus, the one who Paul says in Ephesians 2, is our peace. He's the one who unites us together. And imagine the peace, the peace that you have when you approach the throne of grace. I imagine two groups of people. And I throw the quotation up there so you know I'm not just using my sanctified imagination. In early writings, I was reading it. And as I was reading this, there was two groups of people approaching the throne of grace. One of them was a group of discord and a group that really was about causing disbelief and deception. And for some reason, they felt like they were doing that in the name of the Lord and they were approaching the throne of grace. And there was another group that was doing it for unity and saying they wanted, they wanted this will to be done. In the context is 1844, you find the, the belief system that's attached there. And so this group is uniting their voice to Jesus. They, they rose up with Jesus and they would send up their faith to him in the holiest and pray, Father, give us your spirit. And Jesus would breathe upon them the Holy Ghost. And that breath was light, power, much joy, love. Sorry, much love, joy, and peace. I want to be a part of that group. But imagine the second group, that they're praying there as well, but they're, for whatever reason, it's, it's not for holy purpose. And they say, Father, give us thy spirit. Who are they really praying to? And there's this, this unity and there's deception and there's all of that going on. They're not really praying to the holy God we're talking about. They're not really praying to our high priest. They're praying to Satan himself, the author of confusion, the author of disunity. And they'd say, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep these, this group, them, deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. I say, wow, how could I ever get to the point where I would pray to Satan? That's got to be a long, few, quite a few steps, right? But really, if we don't understand who Jesus is, who are we praying to? To either Christ or a form of Antichrist. So I want to make sure that I'm in this group that's saying, Lord Jesus, bring us unity. Help us take your message to this world. And if you like, give me the love, joy, and peace. Only you can give. And so I want to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. I want to be linked to him and linked to you in such a way that nothing can ever sever that link. And then if it ever got to the point where I would have to face the flames like we started off with, that there I would be. I would Imagine if you were there and you were one of the ones that was going to be burned at the stake. Imagine the smell as, as you approach with guards right there. And, and as you were approaching this place there, you see the smoke arising. You hear the sounds of animals attacking people. You hear all of that going on. And you hear every once in a while songs mingled into the whole situation. You're like, whoa, what's going on here? The smell of burning flesh. If you've never smelled it, it's a horrible smell. And there you are approaching this place. And one that betrays you to the authorities stands nearby. Grin on his face as they count out the money. He tried to lift him up as he started to turn away with his ill-gotten gain. Saying, brother, I love you. I'll always be your friend. But he seems angry as he turns away. And then they take you to this place. You can see kind of a brief hillside here and then the buildings. They begin to line you up as Christians. Can you kind of get it in your mind's eye? Can you kind of put yourself there as maybe one of the suffering ones? What's going to sustain you during that time? Not all the classes I took. Not all the Greek and stuff I know. It's only going to be the bond of peace. And so imagine there you are and the what happens is the smell of human flesh burning is replaced with a smell of pitch, resin of trees. Maybe it brings back a few memories when you were walking in some forest. And that smell gets closer and you realize they're going to smear the pitch all over you. And the realization hits you that you are next to be let on fire. But as they begin to smear the pitch upon you, you begin to hear songs somewhere nearby of someone, other Christians, burning. And this peace overtakes you. And you start singing to Jesus the most lovely song. A love song. 
A song that echoed down through the ages, eternity past. From the beginning of time. A song that God had already planned to be on your lips as the plan of salvation. And that song encourages somebody else further down the line that's going to be lit after you. And it encourages the one up the line who's already been lit. And you guys unite. This is a song that God knew would be on our lips. All around you would hear the song. Some would go silent. And the song would grow louder and louder as the pain increased. They would all hear the voice of Jesus through you. I don't know about you, but it had to be a bond of peace that would enable me to have the power to do something like that. Not just power and strength, but love, joy, and deep, deep peace. Peace that they cannot take away. Peace that even if they tried to burn it out of me, no matter what the world would throw at me, I would still be united with my Savior. I would still be encouraging my brothers and sisters in Christ. And imagine you died, pouring your fellow Christians and others, others, to God. It's exactly what we find recorded in historical accounts. We find that the executions were involving animals, pitch being smeared upon them. It was so grisly that even the onlookers had sympathy for the victims. And it turned against Nero for his popularity. He did not become more popular for that. In fact, people turned against him because of that. And Christianity continued to spread. Paul himself had the bond of peace, that same bond of peace I just described to you. And what we find is, to the very end, he has it. This is Fox's account. Paul the Apostle, who before was called Saul, after his great travail and unspeakable labors in promoting the gospel of Christ, he suffered in this first persecution under Nero. Abdias declareth that under his execution, Nero sent two of his esquires, Ferrega and Parthemius. Ferrega and Parthemius. Them, two people, right? To bring him, Paul, word of his death. So I want you to notice in the story how it's progressing. These two individuals are coming to bring him word of his death. Watch what Paul does. They, coming to Paul, that's, that's Ferrega and Parthemius, the esquires, right? What do they find Paul doing? Instructing the people. Let him know. About Jesus. They desired him to pray for them. Who's the them? The Esquires. Eventually, it's either the Esquires or the group. Okay? It's either the group that sees the Esquires coming with a death sentence, or it's the Esquires who, who hear Paul beginning instructing these people. As I look at the context, it, it seems to be that it influences these individuals who come with a death sentence. And desire him to pray for them that they might believe. The other ones are believers already. If he's talking to believers, then these are unbelievers, whoever they are. Who told them, Paul told them, that shortly after they should believe and be baptized. In the sepulcher. In other words, you would see my death. You would believe. This done, the soldiers came and led him out of the city to the place of execution. Where he, that's Paul, after his prayers were made, still connected, gave his neck to the sword. And, and back then, in an act of defiance or in an act of, you're not controlling me, they would oftentimes just move the clothing down and say, go ahead. And so imagine giving your neck to the sword. And so Paul sustains that, is sustained through the bond of peace as well. Christ was his peace. Christ was the peace of the ones who were suffering in the flames. And Christ can be our peace Two, regardless of what we're facing today or tomorrow or in the future. So I don't know about you, but isn't that a wonderful thing to be happy about? I feel really good knowing that Jesus is mine, that He's in my heart, that no matter what I face, in essence, He faces it with me. Jesus is mine. Is He yours? Do you have that blessed assurance? I want to invite Don to come play on the, uh, for our closing song here. I want to endeavor to lead you in the song. But if you'd like to say, Jesus, you are mine. I want your peace. I want that blessed assurance. And I just want to say, Jesus, be mine. I invite you to take out your hymnals and, or to read up on the screen there and to sing this beautiful song to Jesus. I don't know if it'll be the song that I will sing at the end when I'm persecuted, but it's a song I'm going to sing today. Jesus is mine. Please stand.
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending break from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And so may the Lord sit enthroned upon each one of our hearts. May the Lord sit as king forever. May the Lord give us strength. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Amen.